So as an environmental anthropologist, my first piece of research that I did was around the culture of household waste um, in Palmerston North, so in the city where we are. And through the research that I did there, um, I discovered that the, it was the emotional triggers that really impacted on how people thought about reducing plastics in household waste. And so for me as a mother, I found that, you know, I, I tried to avoid waste, uh, plastic waste in the house, because of the toxic nature of plastic, as I was learning about through the research. Um, and it was in, indeed a strong tr trigger, um, but it was very, very, very difficult to, to avoid because you go into a supermarket and there is plastic everywhere. So I started thinking about individual consumption and responsibility of the consumer and how, how difficult that is and how, um, how it's far more important to think about sort of um, broader structures of power uh, and politics and legislation reg regulation rather than focusing on the individual consumer. Some of my research has been around kind of digital culture and materialities and then actually through knowing you and being asked to make a short film for Carrying Our Future, the activist group you're involved with. I kind of got to thinking about the relationship between plastics and media, because when people have written about media and materiality, we think about silicon or copper or cobalt and coltan. But actually, an awful lot of our microelectronics are plastics, whether it's the printed circuit boards or the buttons or the casing that lives around the wiring in all of this. So when you think about plastics in e-waste, I mean I, I would see those as marginal and peripheral in terms of the discourses around e-waste, where, where you talk more about sort of the, the precious stuff, because when we're talking about recycling e-waste, there's always such a focus on the gold, you know, and all the precious metals that are inside and what you can claim back from that, but the plastics always seem to be omitted from all of those discussions. Well in many cases the plastics are the kind of unwanted stuff that just gets thrown away. So when people talk about gold, for example, it's reclaimed from the connectors that are on the silicon chips that are on the printed circuit boards. Mm -hmm. So the printed circuit boards are a thermoset plastic, but that's not the valuable thing that you want to get back. In fact, they're almost impossible to recycle. So what you find are those things are being burned or dissolved in acids so that you can reclaim the other precious metals from that kind of assemblage. There are some other plastics, thermoplastics rather than thermoset plastics, that can be reclaimed and recycled and are just melted down from e-waste into quite low grade plastics. And there have been some health issues that have come up around those as well, because whilst they're now banned historically, those plastics would have contained PBB or PBD, so brominated flame retardants that are quite toxic, bad for human fertility. And when you're melting those plastics down and putting them in other things, they're now being found in cheaply manufactured children's toys, for example. I sort of find that entanglement, those sorts of entanglements, really interesting. And it's something that speaks to some of the specificities of the different materials, the, the plastics themselves, but also the plasticizers and things that Colorants are added and, mm. to them. And the fact that while often we just think of them as plastic, these quite different petrochemical based substances do in some cases have quite different effects. Mm, mm. And they're quite often effects that we can't um, necessarily determine either. In fact, the latest research has shown that 19 to 95% of all humans have some level of BPA in them. That's disturbing considering a low level of BPA has potentially um, catastrophic impacts on the human endocrine system. The, the testing protocols for endocrine disruptors are very different from tradi traditional conventional testing protocols. In a conventional testing protocol, the higher the dose, the higher the toxicity. That works on the opposite for endocrine disrupting chemicals. The lower the dose, the higher the potential uh, hazard or risk. And the threshold isn't a stable limit. So one of the things I was looking at was some printers that use kind of plastic based thermal dyes mm. and the rate of absorption from BPA in those isn't a constant thing. So if your hands were wet for example you absorbed 10 times as much yeah. BPA. So this is something that ends up inside your system even from coming into physical contact with your skin. Mm. It's kind of 
highlighting the fact that we're a bit more permeable and leaky as organisms than we often kind of assume. Yeah, but it's also the cumulative effect that's often forgotten about when we think about um, our, um, our exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals in plastics, thermal paper and, and otherwise. And we're surrounded in plastic with again those sorts of priority chemicals that have been banned elsewhere or should be banned um, and certainly shouldn't be in our everyday plastic consumer products, certainly not in those food containers I would, I would argue. But there are a lot of food packaging that's very difficult for the average consumer to avoid on a weekly basis when they're busy, when they don't have access to alternatives, when they don't have the money to spend on, a, on, on alternative products that don't have that sort of packaging in them. That's for me when it, society needs to change its, its policies and legislation around that rather than leaving it up to consumer choice to protect themselves from potentially toxic plastic products. So we've spoken quite a lot about some of the, the really serious issues around toxicity, around waste, around health that kind of plastic speak to in a number of ways. What do you see as the most promising kind of interventions or solutions in this area? I know there's some really exciting and innovative stuff being done around um, producing alternative plastics that are environmentally benign. There is still a lot of work to be done around that. I have concerns around um, you know, social, social justice issues, uh, sort of fair trade issues even around um, alternative plastics. I think I agree with you about the fact that some of the work around bioplastics looks really promising, but at the same time, if we're talking about producing over 300 million tonnes of bioplastics a year, there's a question of, so where are we going to grow this stuff? Mm. Similar things have been happening around fuel and bioethanol, and what's been found is that there's only a limited amount of space on the planet, and we've already cut down most of the forests to, to grow food for people. Mm. And if we're competing for that space between growing food for poor people and growing fuels and plastics for rich people, in a market system, it's the poor people who lose out in that. I would like to see more of an emphasis on, on the prevention as well. And certainly in terms of microelectronics, mm. where we've had real success in terms of PBB, PBD, but also mercury, lead, cadmium and hexavalent chromium was the European Union's ROHS directive, so the restriction of hazardous substances in microelectronics, mm. which said to manufacturers, you are not allowed to use these substances in new products. Mm. And so that regulatory ban from a kind of interstate organisation that speaks for 750 million odd people was something that really did force producers to change their practices mm. and it wasn't something that was enthusiastically adopted by those product producers. They campaigned quite hard saying this is going to cost us lots of money and we're going to struggle to find alternatives that will mean that you'll have microelectronics that are as reliable. They said that getting rid of lead from solder would mean that solder would be much more brittle. It would develop what are called tin whiskers and your electronic devices would stop working. So they'd need to be thrown away more often and actually it would end up being more of an environmental burden. Hmm. But actually in practice that hasn't been found to be true at all. In fact, using tin solder now, they're able to make microelectronic devices smaller. So I think it's a good example that really shows that where you can have really quite effective action that has removed some of the most toxic substances from an entire class of products comes from regulation that targeted design and that comes from a large body that represents a huge number of people. The Stockholm Convention and the Montreal um, Protocol, you know, 30 of the priority pollutants that are considered hazardous, toxic and you know, dangerous um, were taken completely off the market 
and alternatives were found that were that worked perfectly well. Um, so I think you know at an international level, um, speaking to national level EPAs and, and you know environmental protection agreements and so on um, is is really important. We, we did some research around um, the Pacific Islands. I think it's really important for New Zealanders and others to think about those sort of shadow, shadow places, those places that Val Plumwood from Ecological Humanities talks about. If we send stuff to the Pacific Islands, it's a particularly fragile ecosystem and a Economy. What happens to it there? Does it ever come back out again? And largely what we discovered, it was, it was being burned, barged and buried, so the three Bs. So then we started looking at, again, the international conventions and agreements and sort of what was going on in terms of the international connections, trade agreements and the local environmental protection agreements and the sustainable development goals and we found that they just weren't articulating. You know, so there is a very strong argument for building in product stewardship, you know, environmental producer responsibility into trade agreements to ensure that they match up nicely um, with national environmental protection agreements so that people's health and the environment and the economy are all taken care of as a result of that packaging. That also speaks to the issue with regulation that struggles to be enforced. Mm. And so alongside ROHS, the EU brought in a waste electronics and electrical equipment directive that was meant to do some of that job around extended producer responsibility. So a fraction of what you pay for a new computer or smartphone is supposed to go towards the safe local disposal of that device. Mm. But actually when follow-up studies have been done, they found that most retailers actually aren't accepting people to return old things when they buy new things. Mm. That a lot of consumers simply don't know that these laws exist and so things are either still getting thrown away or you have a bunch of rogue companies that claim to be doing the kind of responsible local high-tech recycling of these devices, but actually that costs considerably more than just shipping it out. And so an awful lot of e-waste that people think is going to be dealt with responsibly still finds its way into these illegal flows of waste where you see the harrowing footage of kids burning the plastic coatings off of copper wires so that they can sell those bits of copper for a few cents. There was a some piece of research done last year looking at the 8 million tonnes of waste going into the ocean per annum. China is number one in terms of countries that manage to find plastic waste going into their waterways, into the oceans. So why would we want to send our plastic recycling to a country that's really struggling um, with its own waste issues? They've got a really low recycling rate themselves and yet we're sending our recycling there for them to deal with. And you've just you know, sort of mentioned some of the human rights issues and the, the health issues. It's, it's absolutely the case for um, not just e-waste plastics, but plastics in general over there. But the thing is too, isn't it, the science has to be made accessible in many cases around some of these really crucial environmental issues. The work that I'm doing around um, the marine science in, in Galway, they want to know what does it look like when the the newsprint media pick up their research, how do they interpret that and how do they then present that to the public and does that in fact have an impact on policy? So there can be a huge gap between the actual research that's done and any change that happens at the end of it. I'm interested to know what happens along, along the way, does it get diluted, does the story get changed around? Um, but I do think that public outreach around science around this, this area is incredibly important for, for making political change. I have a particular problem with what's going on in New Zealand. We're being audited by our own plastics industry. So we have the Packaging Council that audits the recycling and the, you know, the, the packaging situation in New Zealand. How can we have an independent audit when that's being audited by the plastics industry themselves? Probably the other thing to mention too is, yes EPR, um, yes alternative plastics, um, yes prevention, but also maybe we should be focusing on a set of priority plastics to begin with. And the research that was done by Ro Chelsea Roshman and her team of marine scientists a few years back looked at a set of four priority plastics. And those priority plastics were identified because they were so highly problematic in a variety of different contexts, particularly marine environments and the high toxicity. So maybe we should be focusing on four to begin with, 
Um, and I think that it's always good to start with a small number. I mean, I think that's why I started in New Zealand looking at single-use plastics, because it's kind of the easy go-to. And once you have momentum around that, you can use the same story, the same argument, and that can be applied to cystirenes, and then it can be applied to other things that are also equally problematic. One of the things that this conference looks at is the idea of interdisciplinarity and how that might speak to some of these issues around plastics, waste and toxicity, rather than thinking in an interdisciplinary frame to begin with. As an environmental anthropologist, what what does that discipline bring to these kinds of discussions? Most of the, or a lot of the work that has traditionally been done around plastics and waste uh, comes largely from a national natural science or a life science perspective. And those, while those sciences are absolutely you know, vital for finding answers to some of the really pressing challenges around plastic waste, they miss a lot of the, the, the political, the cultural, the social complexities that um, really, really need to be uh, drilled down into if we're really going to understand who's producing the waste, how is it allowed to happen, how are we using it, how are we discarding of it, and who's impacted as a result of that. What about for you, what about sort of media studies? If we want to understand issues around kind of the global plastics crisis, the global climate crisis, the global drop in biodiversity, we absolutely need the fundamental science to understand mm. the world and the processes around us. Mm. But when we think about affecting change, what we've seen, and climate change is a great example here, we've known more than enough for us to really be taking action for a long time now, but it hasn't happened. And that question of how do you affect social change, how do we understand what's going on from a cultural, from a political standpoint, is something that really speaks to the social sciences and humanities. And so that's where I see the real benefits of interdisciplinary collaboration. But what about some of the challenges that you see, you know, do you see any significant challenges in working in this interdisciplinary way? Different disciplines speak very different languages, so finding a common language that allows people from very different backgrounds to actually speak to one another in a meaningful way can be really, really challenging. Mm -hmm. Quite often we use the same terms, but then we use it in either very or slightly different ways. And we think we're speaking about the same things, but actually we're not at all. I think one of the real benefits to this interdisciplinary kind of an exchange around these big questions is that um, it really forces us to reflect on our own the way that we express ourselves, but also on our own dis disciplines. It really makes us examine ourselves and, our, and the work that we do and how we do it. So by way of a conclusion, what are the big takeaways from this this area for you? I mean, as an anthropologist, for me, it comes about through you know, culture change. It's not about um, technical solutions, primarily. How about for you in terms of moving forward or sort of, you know, where to go f f from here or some sort of conclusions? Thinking beyond the individual to these much larger systems, and that means thinking about regulation at national, international levels. It means thinking about design and how we target design, but it doesn't just mean thinking in a design-led way because that tends to be quite a technocratic engineering focused way to dealing with what are often political problems mm -hmm. and so that's for me where this idea of political ecology really comes to the fore because it highlights the fact that this isn't just a kind of ideologically neutral series of decisions. I think it's really important to still to not forget the local communities and um, campaign groups, environmental you know, activists. There can kind of be an assumption sometimes that regulation means governments will do it themselves and we should leave them alone. But of mm. course, there is a real case to be made for people to pressure their governments to write to their MPs or representative, mm. because if those representatives don't realise that these are important issues that people care about, they won't address them.